The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who are eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread through the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and went, according to his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He enrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today the scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. I have said before that if I were to have you stand up and made you come into the church at 5 a.m., and started to read from the scripture, and had you stand here until evening, you'd weep too. <laughs> but for different reasons than the people in the scripture who were weeping. Nothing happens in a vacuum. You see, what's taking place here is important that you and I understand within the proper context, lest we fail in our understanding. And that's exactly what was happening. The reason that the people were weeping is for the first time in their lives, the scripture was being read to them, but it was being translated in a language they could understand. It was being read in Hebrew, but was being translated in Aramaic. Can you imagine if you came to Mass and the scriptures were being proclaimed in Swahili? You wouldn't understand. You would have no way of knowing what those scriptures meant or what was being taught or what was being said unless you spoke Swahili. Anybody here speak Swahili? Raise your hands. I don't see anybody. You see, you understand. So Ezra the priest, on the first day of the seventh month, brought the law before the assembly. He brought the word of God before the assembly. And he read out of the book. And all the people listened attentively to what he was reading. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform. He stood on the Temple Mount, and just as the priest stood on the wooden platform, Ezra raised the book, just as I did when the gospel was proclaimed. And you did exactly what those people did in the scripture, because it says that as he opened the scroll so that the people might see, he opened the book 
And all of the people stood up. And so when the word of God is being proclaimed, we stand at the gospel. And the reason we stand at the gospel is because Jesus Christ is particularly present to us in the gospel. Remember, this is the word of God, and Jesus is the word made flesh. The word made flesh. And so Ezra blessed the Lord, and all of the people, their hands raised high, answered, Amen, Amen. We say, praised be Jesus Christ after the gospel. Then they bowed down and they prostrated themselves before the Lord with their faces to the ground. That is the proper posture before God. Body language means a lot. Body language says everything. And so there is, there is a reason why when we come into the church, we do the things that we do. The first thing that we do when we come into the church is we dip our fingers into the holy water and we make the sign of the cross, the sign of our faith. And by blessing ourselves with the holy water, we are reminded of our baptism. We are reminded of the promises that God makes through us in baptism and the promises that we make to him. And when I dip my fingers in that holy water and I bless myself, my venial sins are washed away. I've had people say to me, I never knew that, Father. Remember, when you were washed in that baptismal font and that water washed over you, the original sin in your life was washed away. And so dipping your fingers into that holy water and blessing yourselves and recalling your baptism washes those venial sins away. And then I enter the church, and the next thing I do is I genuflect before the blessed sacrament, and I should bow my head. I should genuflect before the Blessed Sacrament and bow my head. Now, I know some people can't because when you get older like me, you start to develop problems. But nonetheless, at the very least, we should make a reverential bow and bow our heads. That's the proper posture before God. And so we genuflect before the Blessed Sacrament and we bow to the altar. And we bow to the altar because it is the most sacred piece of furniture in the church. It is where the holy sacrifice of the Mass takes place. It is where bread and wine become Jesus Christ. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so the way we conduct ourselves, our body posture, as Jesus read from the scripture, and he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The way that we conduct ourselves our body posture acknowledges this eternal truth that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. And so as we stand, standing is a sign of deep respect. When somebody important walks into a room, you stand. You don't just sit there like this. Second reading. All of the members of the body are indispensable. God has constructed the body in such a way. He's designed it. And every single member of the body has a role. Every single member of the body is important. And so as we come to Mass, as we come to worship, 
we are doing the very same thing that the people were as Ezra the priest read from the scroll of the book as he stood at the ambo. At Mass, the whole Christ is present. The priest who acts in his ministerial role, exercising his ministerial priesthood as head, and all of the members of the body are gathered together. Every member designed and brought into being to, by Christ and through Christ, in Christ and for Christ. And so together, head and members, we together offer the sacrifice of the Son because we have been baptized into his body. We are Christ's body. And so we come to Mass and we offer the sacrifice of the Son to the Father for the sins of the people. And then there was the responsorial psalm. O Lord our God, your words are spirit and life. Jesus came to free us from all that bound us, from blinded us, and for kept us from experiencing the freedom that God created for us to be. O oh Lord our God, your words are spirit and life. And so our posture, every member of my body, my hands, my eyes, my feet, every single member of my body must give glory to God. Must give glory to God. In a few moments, we're going to transition from the Liturgy of the Word to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And before we do that, we're all going to stand. And we are going to profess our faith. And there is a part in our faith that we are going to profess by saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. my body posture, how I conduct myself in this life must acknowledge that that is an eternal truth. How is it possible, my brothers and sisters, that as Christians we profess that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life, and yet we practice contraception? We contracept. In contraception, we decide when life begins. Not the Holy Spirit, not God. How is it possible that we stand as Christians and we believe that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life, and yet 49 years ago, two days ago, we passed a law in this country which permitted abortion? It's murder. murder. And we have to say that. We have to call it what it is. When that law was passed, Bishop Fulton Sheen said, Christendom is dead. And what he meant by that was, is that Christendom was supposed to have an effect on the nation. Christianity was meant to influence how we live, the laws we pass. And so when we passed that law on that day, Fulton Sheen said, Christendom is dead. Christianity no longer has any influence of the laws that we pass and on the culture. And yet God has blessed this nation abundantly. We must repent of that. That law must be overturned. If all of the parts of the body, my brothers and sisters, as St. Paul describes it in the second reading, are indispensable, and God has constructed the body in such a way 
that the smaller parts, the hidden parts, are given more honor and are protected. How is it possible that the most vulnerable among us are no longer safe in their mother's wombs? We must repent. We must come before God and we must kneel and we must bow down with our faces to the ground and we must ask God for forgiveness for the sin, for the scandal. You see, the reason those people wept is because for the first time they were understanding what was being proclaimed to them. We too should weep. We too should weep in our understanding that this law, this book, God's word, God's revealed, inspired, divine word became flesh and came to dwell among us. That's what Christmas is about. That's what Christmas is about. It is the reason why Christ came into the world as a vulnerable child to affirm what St. Paul told us in the second reading, that we might understand that we are Christ's body. Every single one of us has a dignity that has been raised to the glory of God because Christ took upon himself our flesh, our human nature. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you come from. How many dollar signs, how many letters behind your name, those are, in, those are incidentals. That stuff can disappear just like that. What matters is who you are. And that is the crisis that we are facing and that we are living in this country right now and in the world. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't understand that we are Christ's body. And that because we are Christ's body, that as Ezra the priest told the people, this is not a day to weep. This is a day to rejoice. This is a day to celebrate. This is why we come to Mass, to celebrate and to rejoice because of his sacrifice and what is being offered us. Rejoice and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made. 